So this presentation is on geophysical methods. It's on chapter 7 of the Geothermal Energy book by William E. Glassley. So the main methods used uh, for geophysical exploration are air magnetic surveys, resistivity, magnetotelluric surveys, otherwise known as MT surveys, gravity surveys, seismicity, reflection seismology, temperature measurements, and remote sensing. As you can see from the picture on the right, here are some of the categories that they fit into. Some of these methods are ground-based methods, and some of them are aerial-based methods, such as the remote sensing and the air magnetic surveys and things that require helicopters, drones, or satellites to do. Most of them are, however, ground-based methods. So the first method that we're going to talk about is aeromagnetic surveys. And a little background on them. Uh, the Earth, as we know, has a two poles that generate a magnetic field, and that is detectable using a compass. Now, another way that the magnetic fields can be generated on Earth is through solar winds and those can be detected with speci uh, specific equipment due to them not being as strong as the magnetic fields generated by the Earth's poles. Um, however, rocks uh, can also have magnetic qualities, especially if they contain iron uh, compounds. So an aeromagnetic survey, um, what it uses is a magnetometer and this what it does is it's possible makes it possible to detect local magnetic fields that are weaker than the earth uh, poles that the magnetic field produced by the earth's poles and by knowing the magnitude and direction of the non-local magnetic fields uh, such as the earth's poles or the solar wind magnetic fields we can find the location of interest uh, for a ge geothermal uh, fluid so these magnetic anomalies uh, are what are of particular interest to us. Uh, so when you have a hot flowing uh, aqueous fluid, it can change the magnetic properties of minerals. And what happens is it results in a uh, reduced magnetic susceptibility. So when you have an iron uh, compound in a rock and you combine it with magma or some other hot fluid, it can change the properties and make it so that it is no longer magnetic and we can't, makes it a little bit harder to detect. However, it's these uh, low magnetic anomalies that are associated with a geothermal system uh, because when you have a, for example, part of a region that you know contains iron compounds in its minerals and then all of a sudden you have a lower magnetic uh, region that is probably associated with a hot fluid flowing through that area. Now here's what an aeromagnetic survey uh, equipment might look like in the real world. As you can see through this pink and slightly bluish striped rocket type device, this is the magnemon murder and it's attached to a drone that will fly over a region that you're trying to detect the magnetic uh, fields, uh, the local magnetic fields, and then that's how you find if the region you're into after subtracting the non-local magnetic fields as we talked about, um, if that one is of, has uh, magnetic anomalies that are associated with the geothermal fluid so this is a type of plot that you can get by doing an aeromagnetic survey. The top is the magnetic anomalies, and then the bottom part is just sort of the region and the elevation of, of the region itself. So as you can see on the very left, you have a area of volcanic rock, and then more towards the center, you have this rectangle, this gray uh, rectangle. That is the hydrothermally alter rocks. So if you compare it with the top part of the plot, you can see that the volcanic rock has a higher magnetic anomaly, but then as you start going into the rectangle of the hydrothermally altered rocks, the 
uh, magnetic anomaly starts to decrease and then after you leave that rectangle of the altered rocks you come into another area um, of just normal uh, rock not being altered at all and the anomaly starts to increase again. So another method for geophysical exploration is resistivity and the basic concept has been used since the mid 1960s and early 1970s. It measures the difference of resistance and conductance of materials. You can uh, sort of compare this to an electrical system, a circuit, where if the resistance is high, the conductance is slow and vice versa. In a geophysical sense, uh, rocks are not very conductive, so they have high resistivities. And on the other hand, fluids can be conductive. So the way that resistivity works is when you have a fluid that enters through the pores of the rock or fractures of the rock, uh, you are making it more conduct conductive. Uh, this is due to uh, the fluid possibly containing dissolved species of electrically charged um, uh, particles or uh, it, if it has a higher concentration, the higher the uh, conductivity would be. So when you have uh, resistivity like this, what you're aiming to do is to send electrical impulses through the uh, ground and detect where there is a lower resistivity because that will lead you to a geothermal system. Um, the probes usually are placed on the surface within a distance of tens to hundreds of meters apart and again they will send the electrical impulses and record the resistivity measured. Um, However, you have to be careful when doing this because resistivity can also change due to different rock materials uh, being in contact with each other or heat uh, temperature can alter the, the co uh, composition of the rock um, and give you a false reading uh, where you're expecting a geothermal system, you just have a alter a hydrothermally altered rock. So from this image you can see some of the components that go into a resistivity setup. You have the transmitter on the very right and then a little farther along you have the receivers. The transmitter is what's going to send the electrical impulses into the ground and it's going to travel. Uh, the receivers are going to start picking up those impulses and based on where it deems that there is an area of lower uh, resistance or higher conductance, that's where there is a possible geothermal system. Or a, again, it could be another, like multiple, a variety of rocks, or temperature might have affected the compound of the rock and altered it slightly. So it's not 100% accurate but it gives you an idea of where to look for a, a geothermal system. Now this plot here it's taken from a geothermal field in Ethiopia. This is a cross section of what the uh, field would look like in a sense. Now you have on the y-axis the elevation on the x-axis the distance in kilometers and then the darker spots are where there is a, a high resistivity while the light areas are low resistivity so in a sense all the wells which you can see as the vertical lines placed the three vertical lines those are being placed in areas where you will be able to tap into a low resistivity uh, area uh, which would hopefully have a geothermal fluid flowing through it. Um, again, not 100% accurate, but if you do everything correctly and you do use some of the other methods, uh, it can be um, more accurate than just randomly drilling a hole and seeing if there is a geothermal uh, fluid or a geothermal system present. Now the next type of geophysical method is the magnetotelluric surveys, otherwise known as MT surveys. 
and the way this works is that the earth the earth varies in magnetic field intensity and orientation throughout the day and these variations can cause small amounts of electrical current to be induced in the crust so when you have these uh, small electrical induced electrical currents you can uh, localize an electric magnetic field and this type of survey is great for deep subsurface flow, uh, fluid flow regions um, but it can be used for multiple uh, depths as well not just the very very deep more recently empty surveys have become more effective into take uh, into creating images of deeper structures um, the reason being they take advantage of the earth's magnetic fields and the, the variation that comes throughout the days um, so these variations uh, create electrical currents that change uh, due to the magnetic field and what you're measuring is how the rock interacts with these different uh, changes in electrical currents you have sensors that are deployed across the landscape to pick up these readings and then after you're done you have a very accurate reconstruction of the geology in the area because the frequency and the magnitude of the currents uh, detected can determine the different types of rocks that are present in the area where you're, where you're doing your research. Another advantage of the MT surveys uh, are the fact that they can be used at very large depths. Um, you can have an, a feature, a geothermal source at 20 kilometers in depth and the MT survey will be able to give you an image and the features at that depth to allow you to create uh, a, a sort of a map to know if this is a geothermal resource in the region or what it may be going on at those depths that with some of the other surveys it's not really uh, very accurate or in some cases possible. So with an empty survey you still need to know some of the uh, surface level uh, readings uh, to be able to know where to drill your hole. Uh, now this would be a plot that would be generated with an MT survey. It's This is taken from the book so it's in black and white unfortunately. Uh, if it was colored it would, you would be able to see the blues and, and greens uh, that they talk about in the description. But basically what it's talking about the white square around 20 meters or 20 kilometers in depth that is supposed to represent a body of magma and now the darker ones around 10 kilometers those are areas of um, geothermal uh, pathways fluid flow pathways now but as you can see with the empty survey it does allow you to get a larger view of or a larger image of the what you may be dealing with with a geothermal system uh, it does go in excess of 20 kilometers in depth which is more than, than enough in some cases uh, and it's definitely more than some of the other sur uh, types of surveys and methods which would not necessarily be surface uh, level but it wouldn't go uh, as in, in as deep as an empty survey can possibly go. Uh, the next type of uh, method that can be used is a gravity survey. Now, as a little bit of a background, you may remember this equation from physics. Um, it's essentially the uh, gravitational force equation. Now, F is the gravitational force, G being the gravitational constant. M1 and M2, the masses of the interacting bodies, of the respective interactive bodies, and R is the distance in between the center of mass of both objects. Uh, this, as was assumed in physics classes, is taking into account, uh, for at least for the Earth, a perfectly spherical object, which we know the Earth is not a perfect sphere. Um, and 
apart from it not being a perfect sphere of the earth also you have to take into account that you're dealing with uh, you're not dealing with planets you're dealing with things in the planet so topography also plays uh, a factor into your your distance from the center of mass of the objects uh, when you're doing a gravity survey so just like in the physics classes we had to assume that the earth was a perfect sphere here we have to assume that the mantle and core of the earth are of the same density uh, that would allow you to have the crust sort of floating on top of this uniform uh, density material um, in order to calculate uh, the gravitational field of the object. Now when you're doing these types of surveys you're searching for the difference in thickness or density of the rock where the measurement is made but you also have to keep in uh, Keep in mind that elevation will have to be factored into the calculations. If you have two points that are very similar in size or identical in size even, if you have one very close to the surface of the, of the earth or the crust, uh, it will have a stronger gravitational force than if it was a kilometer or two uh, deeper. So that's something that needs to be kept in mind when you're doing these calculations because it can affect uh, the overall calculation in the end. Now here's an image of what a gravity survey might be looking at. So what you're doing with a gravity survey is essentially measuring the gravitational field of an object with comp in comparison to a baseline value that you already have. So when you have a gravitational anomaly, uh, they can be positive or negative, depending on your baseline value, of course. Uh, but you will have some sort of equipment, uh, a gra gravimeter, uh, to measure these uh, changes in the gravitational field, the, the variations. And you can get a very precise measurement out of it. So in this case, you would have this mass be the object uh, that you're trying to find the gravitational field for and the rest of the, the ground being the baseline value and essentially this would be the anomaly you would have a different gravitational field here than you would in the rest and essentially with this uh, sensitive equipment you can map out the layout of these areas, these regions, uh, again very precisely because they are very sensitive pieces of equipment uh, that are capable of doing that. So another one of the methods that can be used uh, for geophysical exploration is seismicity and this is an equation, a very simple equation to the sort of relate uh, what's going on and to sort of calculate it in a way. So here you have T being the, the travel time back and forth of the wave, um, D being the distance that the wave traveled, and V the velocity of the wave in the medium. Again, this can change if you have a wave traveling in water as opposed to a solid, it can, it can vary. So the density of the material will play a factor into the velocity and overall time it's going to take for the wave to travel. Now, uh, seismicity has been used in the oil and gas industry and is being currently redefined or refined and adapted for the needs of geothermal uh, exploration. Um, they sort of work the same way as an earthquake would uh, because an earthquake would generate a wave that would be sort of spread out and a seismometer would uh, pick up these readings uh, over a, a large area and be able to tell you uh, sort of the, in, in a way here it would be able to tell you the medium and what's going on as the wave travels. So as mentioned uh, seismicity works in a similar sense to earthquakes the way they, uh, earthquakes are being detected 
So rocks are actually a very good transmitter for low frequency energy, which is exactly what earthquakes are. They, they produce low frequency energy. So uh, we can generate a seismic wave and have sensors uh, spread out to detect the characteristics of the subsurface. So as the wave travels through uh, different material, depending on the density, the wave will propagate faster or slower. Uh, a very dense material, the wave will be faster. Uh, less dense material, it will be slower. So the densities of the material also can play a, a factor into the method that is used to detect uh, geothermal systems. So when you, uh, again, density, uh, the wave moves differently and behaves differently depending on the density. So if you have two materials that are um, very close to each other and you have a, uh, a seismic wave traveling through them, when one encounters a different density material, it will tend to, or it can reflect back. So this is what's called reflection seismology. So reflection seismology uh, uses the same principles as seismicity. Uh, you can say it's a subset of seismicity that can identify where you have these combinations of different materials, different densities of materials. So when, again, the impedance of the materials uh, will make the wave behave in different uh, ways. So if it's traveling through a medium and it encounters a denser material, it may reflect back. Uh, if it encounters a less dense material, it may reflect back. So you can, it's comparable to how light, re um, reflection, refraction of light uh, through a prism the light will refract in a certain way. If you use water, it may refract uh, in a different way. So this is how uh, reflection seismology can be helpful. Uh, the angles of reflection can vary depending on the density of the material itself. Now this is a figure from the book itself. Um, as you can see, you have the source uh, of ignition, which generates the wave. Now, you also have a receiver that's set up. Um, in this case, they don't give us an actual distance, but it's imagine it's far away. And so the wave is traveling through the medium, and then it encounters this darker area, which uh, is a, a geo. It doesn't necessarily have to be a geothermal system, but it can be um, and here it's where it reflects and it will bounce back and it will go the receiver will pick up that and be able to identify uh, what there is now another path that it could have gone was avoid that darker gray rectangle and gone a little bit further down where again it encounters another uh, material with a different density and again it will bounce back at a different angle or it will take a little bit longer to travel um, as well and the receiver can pick this up and you can make your calculations based off of that so it really depends on the medium that is traveling the material it comes in contact with and so there's a lot of things that you can uh, do or you can calculate uh, with these measurements you're getting Here's uh, another image I found uh, online about reflection seismology. As you can see, you have the energy source again on the left. It's traveling through soil, in this case, and it encounters bedrock. Now, the wave actually, it's reflecting at different angles in this case. And that will be picked up by the detectors themselves, the receivers. Um, so again, it's just based on the material that it's reflecting, the medium is traveling through and the material that it's reflecting off of that can uh, make these things vary. And here we have another figure that is taken from the book about reflection uh, seismology. Um, and in this one you can see the different signals, uh, the different signal processing that was uh, techniques that were applied to this study. 
um, again, you, it sort of tells you a little bit there on the side on the rectangles what's going on, but their target is in the circle, and again, you have a darker area there. Uh, all these different uh, areas are of different density materials where the seismic wave was reflecting back, and well, the receiver picked it up, and then it was processed to generate this type of plot. Now, this type of measure uh, method um, can actually be used well to detect a geothermal system in itself, but it can also be used to detect or double check the quality of the data gathered with uh, some of the other systems. Um, that can be done with the other methods as well, but this one uh, would be one of the easier ones to do. Uh, this method is temperature measurements, and what you're doing is essentially you're taking the temperature under the surface to determine the temperature gradient. Um, <coughs> now, this could be done if you're drilling a well and seeing if there is a, a geothermal system. Um, it can be guess and check in that way, but temperature measurements, what it does is actually slightly different. So the way that uh, temperature uh, measurements are analyzed is first you have to create a slim hole. It's not necessarily a well, it's just enough for you to be able to insert your equipment. Uh, now these holes have been able to be drilled into like 2,000 meters, so they go a very long distance into the ground. Again, after you have the hole drilled, you send down your equipment. As the equipment is going down, it's taking rapidly taking various measurements of the temperature as it progresses down in, in the hole. Um, now these temperature, uh, the temperature data that's gathered can be used to generate a temperature profile. Um, with this, you later have to apply it to the next thing, which is the heat flow. Uh, you get heat flow uh, through the core that was taken out when you drill the hole, you can use that to take samples of the different types of rock materials that are present in your area. Uh, you can conduct some testing to see the thermal conductivity of the different materials, and with it you get uh, the heat flow that I talked about. Um, and when you finally have this heat flow and your temperature profile, you can combine them and calculate the geothermal gradient, which will allow you to see the flow or identify where the geothermal system is and the way it's flowing uh, in the area. Now here is an image of a temperature measurement in real life. So you can see you have a building um, and you have the pipe which would represent the slim hole. And you have the groundwater flow represented by the arrow. and here you have these temperature anomalies, but what's important here is as the uh, once you have the slim hole um, drilled, you will send down your instruments to gather the, the temperature data, and then it will gather that temperature data as it goes all the way down to whatever depth you you drilled it or is necessary for you to go to, and then you would, that core again you take it out you test it you get the, the thermal conductivities and then you can get your um, a geothermal gradient. And finally the last method is remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing is actually one of the newest techniques and it's actually a very promising technique. Um, what it's essentially doing is you're using aircraft satellites or drones to scan an area very rapidly mapping in a high resolution way the, the area where you're at for your geothermal exploration. Now uh, what it's doing it's using optical wavelengths uh, to scan the region um, and it does require I made a typo on the screen on the, on the slide um, it does require laboratory measurements to identify the material this being because um, minerals they all have different colors um, and when you're using optical wavelengths you want to 
be able to measure the reflectance back to identify the species, uh, the type of mineral it is. So when you're going into the field and you're, you're scanning your area, you can get these measurements, uh, you can map the area and get these measurements and you can be able to identify the different minerals that are present based on the reflectance of the light. Um, so it can be anywhere from the visible spectrum as well as uh, covering the infrared spectrum which, which is used a lot as well to be able to map uh, these areas out when you're doing your exploration. So here uh, it's a little more in-depth analysis um, but again it's kind of what it's already covered. Um, you have you can use a satellite or an aircraft or a drone something that has these uh, the, the equipment to be able to use infrared or some of the other spectrum uh, to scan the area. And then once you scan the area, the material will either reflect or absorb the light. Uh, here I said infrared light, but it can be some of the other uh, visible spectrum as well. Uh, infrared is what's being used the most. Um, and you have to check these findings with the lab. It, it's what allows you it's a very promising technique. It's a very way of it's it's a rapid way of mapping an area, but you need the the lab to sort of back these things up to to have a reference point to go off of. And doing this will allow to determine approximately the the components that are in the ground um, without actually having to drill anything. This is all done again through a drone, through a satellite, scanning an area essentially with light. So here uh, would be sort of an example of how uh, remote sensing might be used. You have these satellites in space that you can control to scan the area where you're looking at. Um, again, it doesn't need to be in space. You can use aircraft, you can use drones. Um, essentially, you just want something that will give you an aerial, be uh, aerial view and you can scan your region uh, to sort of find out the types of uh, minerals and, and soil, rocks, everything that's in the area, uh, and that all goes back to the way it reflects, the way it absorbs, and how it's referenced to what was found in the lab previously. So here's another figure taken from the book. Uh, in this figure, uh, essentially the way this was done was through the use actually of a satellite. Uh, airborne instruments and ground-based measurements. Uh, researchers were able to find uh, and identify tin calcanite deposits um, that represented uh, local ore concentrations. Um, so this is just a way that remote sensing can be used. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be satellites uh, or drones. It can be a combination of all of them as well. Um, However, remote sensing does have issues right now. It's, it is the newest type of uh, geothermal exploration, the, the more promising technique for the future. So right now it's limited into the locations you kind of have to use it on. It needs to be low rainfall and, and things like that. Uh, but it is very new and it is being looked into and researched into how to develop this to be able to use it almost anywhere. Um, because it does provide uh, very rapid mapping of an area as long as you have that lab reference to go off of but um, it's something that can be very helpful um, when you're trying to look for a geothermal system